Greetings, loyal listeners and new recruits. I'm Drew Deach. I'm Travis Newton. And this is Genre Vision. Every week, Travis and I review and recommend horror films, action movies, fantasy flicks, sci fi cinema, and more. And this week, we have an action versus double feature for you with True Lies versus Hard Target. Before we do that, we do just have a couple calls to action up front. Uh, we want to remind everyone, hey, we've got a new Finflix episode out on Shark Attack 2, which is a movie maybe not a lot of you have, have seen. Just to let you know, it is available legally for free on YouTube on the Film Rise channel. Listen to our episode and maybe you'll want to watch Shark Attack 2 by the time it's over. Uh, I had a really fun time with that episode. Same. Yeah, it's a good time. And if you like what we do here on the show, please go to patreon.com slash genrevision. Become a premium subscriber. We have two tiers, a $2 one, which gives you access to all of our Finflix bonus material, and our $5 premium subscription, which gets you access to all of our bonus material for all the Genre Vision shows. We have weekly pre-show discussions, extended currently consumings every month, and a whole bunch of other stuff over there at patreon.com slash genre vision. And I think that'll pretty much do it for Calls to Action, and we can jump right into our verses. And I, I guess we're going to start with True Lies. Uh, even though it was it came out a year after Hard Target. But True Lies is the one that the majority of people, I would say, know about. It's a James Cameron movie. It was the movie he directed after Terminator 2 changed blockbuster cinema forever. It was, at the time, the first movie to cost over $100 million. It was projected you know as this very big deal is it's you know it's arnold and james cameron teaming up again it's got jamie lee curtis it's gonna be this big it's basically arnold's chance to play a james bond type and i i, I will admit that, uh or i will cop to that i i also wrote a piece about true lies recently and the angle of my piece was why don't we talk about true lies anymore? Because I don't see it crop up in a lot of conversation about action film or, or blockbuster cinema from the era. And upon revisiting true lies, I think we found out a few reasons why that might be. Yeah. True lies. If you don't know, is actually a remake of a French film that came out in 1991. That movie was called La Total. I think internationally it might've been called jackpot, but it's not, all that available. I, I tried to get my hands on this movie and, and see it before today's episode, but I, I wasn't able to. I, I was able to find trailers and clips from the movie in places like YouTube, but I, I just wasn't able to see the full thing. I would probably have to order a very out of print DVD from overseas to actually see it. So I really don't have a great idea of what that film was like, but it was, you know, it, it is described as more of a comedy than True Lies, even though True Lies is definitely an action comedy. Um, it's pretty apparent that it's an action comedy from the beginning, although it's not nearly as farcical as a lot of action comedies that we might see, uh, or, or, you know, a typical action comedy that we think of in American cinema. Well, I, I think it's important to note that this is written and directed by James Cameron. And as far as I can think of, this is his only real attempt at doing something that is as as front facing a comedy there's certainly comedic elements in in his movies but this is the only one that i can think of that it's like this is unavoidably an action comedy sure like aliens has its funny beats t2 has its funny beats mm -hmm. but yeah this is definitely cameron's most genre bending film in his filmography this displays i think cameron's limitations in the kind of tones that he's able to explore because there were times when they tried to bring comedy writers on this movie for punch up to actually write, you know, more, I don't know, traditional jokes for the time period. Um, and Cameron wasn't a fan of any of that kind of stuff. He decided basically that he was going to write all the jokes himself. And uh, the results are mixed. <laughs> it's not a terribly funny action comedy. Well, it, it's it's also not so much just jokes, but the way Cameron plays certain moments like the, there's a there's a moment in the opening in which Arnold is doing this whole infiltration thing. And uh, which which was definitely I know Hideo Kojima has seen True Lies because there's so much of the first Metal Gear Solid game uh, in this movie. Um, 
And this opening where Arnold sneaks into this party through, you know, scuba gear and all this stuff. When he's being chased on the way out, he gets attacked by these two dogs and the two dogs come up and he grabs the two dogs and smacks their heads against each other. And it's like I laughed because it was shocking. Yeah, it's real shocking. (laughs) And then there's other kinds of things that the movie seems to think is a joke, but I don't quite understand what the purpose of it was. Like he's at this party. He's got his perfect tuxedo on um, and he comes out of a bathroom or a place where he wasn't supposed to be. And this vaguely Arabic looking guy with an earpiece in comes up to him and, um, you know, with a sort of concerned look on his face. And then Arnold Schwarzenegger says something in Arabic and the subtitles come up and say, I have to take a major leak. And then in parentheses down below on another line, it says perfect Arabic. And I thought, well, why do we have to qualify that? Well, I I thought it was going to be like. Oh, because he spoke it perfectly, the guy was going to be suspicious of him, that it was going to be a plot point. No, that never comes up. So I was like, what was the point of that? Was that supposed to be a joke? Uh, Is it funny because it's saying something slightly vulgar and like I have to take a major leak, but then saying it's perfect, it's being said in perfect Arabic is... Is that funny? Yeah, I don't understand what additional (laughs) context that kind of stuff adds. And like the whole movie is kind of full of weird off moments of humor where you're just like, I'm not quite sure what James Cameron thinks is funny about that in particular. Um, I mean, there are there are moments of comedy in the film that are like so exceedingly broad, you know, most having to do with like slapstick that you're like, okay, I understand why that is funny on just like a pure slapstick level or more so certain performers such as Tom Arnold as kind of the sidekick character. He is he is basically doing shtick. It's insufferable. I, I think in the piece that I wrote, I called him like beleaguered alpha male shtick. I don't know. It's it's more like a uh, he talks about how many divorces he's had. He seems like you know that kind of beta male stereotype who who wants to think he's you know, um, not beaten down. <laughs> you know, it's but the most important is like if you know Tom Arnold, this is his deal, and that's just kind of his his character in the movie. And so it's like it's those kinds of attempts at humor, and none of that ever clicks. Um, that's not to say that the movie is completely humorless. Sure. There are a couple of moments where I, I got a decent laugh out of it. And to be fair, I think, I think the majority of the cast is good. Uh, we can talk about what they had to work with, but I, I, I don't think Arnold is the joke that some people view him as because he, he, even if he is, he's in on the joke and he embraces it. He's a good comedy actor. He absolutely is. Like there is legitimately funny stuff that he has done in things like jingle all the way, which is not a good movie, but Arnold is a funny performer. Like he understands how to work humor. I mean, him punching the camel in Conan, the barbarian, they know that's funny and he knows it's funny and they play it at just the right tempo and mood. Yeah. Then the hell with you. I mean that even that line, like is so <laughs> po faced that it's, it's, it can't be anything but hilarious. I mean, even if it wasn't trying to be uh, Arnold's just a funny dude. And this movie has a hard time positioning him as this like super spy character because he's, he's not the kind of debonair tuxedoed super spy. Well, <laughs> the whole plot of the film is, emotionally centered on Schwarzenegger's character's marriage. He's married to Jimmy Lee Curtis's character. And in the beginning of the film, you know, where we have this introductory action scene in Switzerland down in the frozen lake where, you know, he's in the tuxedo and he tells the guy he has to take a quote, major leak in perfect Arabic. He's flirting with this character played by Tia Carrere, who you might recognize from the Wayne's world films. And you get the impression that like, this is a guy who, you know, he's like the the globe trotting debonair super spy. He works for a secret uh, division called Omega Sector, uh, which is headed up by Charlton Heston in an eye patch and in sort of a clear Nick Fury riff. But he does have a domestic life, and it is portrayed as exceedingly mundane and boring. And it, the whole movie is basically like, well, what happens when this super spy? has uh, anxiety that he's being cuckolded. Yes, well, well, I mean, because the basic premise is, what if James Bond had a wife that he had to hide his super spy activities from? Mm-hmm. That, that's kind of the, the, the big picture pitch. But what if his wife was also doing something on the sly, you know, to deceive him? Like, who's being more deceitful? Well, that's where I can see the farce coming in from the original version, because farce 
very often is all about miscommunication. Yeah. And 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 the miscommunication in this is that Arnold goes to to visit Jamie Lee Curtis when when she's at work and she overhears or he overhears her talking on the phone and it sounds like she's talking to another man that she's having an affair with. And he follows her and it turns out that she's meeting this guy uh Simon played by Bill Paxson who we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, and he is telling her that he is some kind of secret agent when really he's, he's BSing her to try and get her to sleep with him. And it's like, okay, I, when you put this all on paper, this sounds like a really classic kind of good setup for some farcical humor. Right. And it sounds like it's going to be almost sort of romantic action comedy where, you know, you have this wife who's bored, who wants someone in her life who's debonair and dashing and you know is is mysterious and little does she know she does have that at home because her husband's mr super spy but he's but arnold has to pretend he's a computer salesman which right how can you buy arnold as a computer you know there's a scene early on when he's like oh i'm telling you about the new txx model or whatever and it's just like you you can't ever buy for a second that that's what he really does right which you know in a farce is fine sure we, we got to talk about Bill Paxton. Yeah. Obviously, you know, we, we still miss Bill Paxton. And we've talked about, I think, I, I think we can both agree that the comedy of the war, the movie is way, I would say, like 90% miss and 10% hit. Uh, extremely dysfunctional. Yeah. But Bill Paxton shows up and all of a sudden the movie is working. And I'll admit to some bias here, but I also think Bill Paxton gets this as a comedy. Yeah, I this is sort of where I I felt that the movie was actually two different movies that were being smushed together uh sort of forcibly by James Cameron. Mm-hmm. And you have Bill Paxton acting in this totally different movie. Because you know in in the first um first act and you know the beginning of second act of True Lies, you're thinking, okay, this is a sort of heightened comic terrorist thriller where you have this really awful uh not only a really awful Arab stereotype, but like this, he beats T- uh, Tia Carrera's character, slaps her really forcibly, and you're like, oh, oh, this is going to be about, you know, Super Spy taking down this like mega asshole terrorist. There is like this really long and involved and, and slapsticky chase sequence through um, what is supposed to be DC, but evidently they shot a fair amount of this in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the whole thing where he's chasing, he's being chased by Arnold on a horse. As he's on a motorcycle, there's a lot of that stuff that's really excitingly staged. Uh, It goes on a shockingly long time. It's a really long chase. It's a really long movie. Way too long. Um, And then after this big chase sequence is done where Arnold, Arnold's dumbass character tries to jump a horse off a hotel roof onto the roof of a skyscraper across the street. You're like, okay, well, this idiot asshole uh, is about to kill this horse (laughs) and himself to try and chase this terrorist. You're like, okay. Uh, what's going on here? And then the movie puts the fucking brakes on all of that. And then for the next hour and change only focuses on the whole marital anxiety or, uh, the cheating anxiety plot. The premise that was obviously the, the driving force in the French original, but now Cameron has tacked on sort of this bigger blockbuster action James Cameron story onto the movie with this this terrorist group called Ugh, the Crimson Jihad. Oof. Uh, what a terrible name. Yeah, the leader um, of the Crimson Jihad is played by this guy named Art, Art Malik or Art Malik. And you know, he's got a very recognizable mug, um, you know, looks to be a really strong character actor. He's playing for the nosebleeds. Oh, absolutely. But yikes, is this character a, uh, you know, in retrospect, this character is a uh, real fucking mess and a really, really bad uh, stereotypical portrayal. I mean, cartoony doesn't even do it justice. Yeah. And the fact that they try to to shoehorn in some um, sincere political commentary at the end in, in the third act is like, oh, no, you know, you're basically like trying to legitimize your temple of doom take. Yikes. Go listen to our Strange Days episode if you want to see how James Cameron handles very direct political discussion in his movies. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> but when this farce happens and, and Bill Paxton shows up and 
is just stealing the movie because it's like, yeah, this is kind of the comedy that I would expect from this premise. And Bill Paxton is playing it perfectly. He is supposed to be this overly sleazy, scummy guy that would lie to this woman and say he's a secret agent to get to get her to sleep with him when really he's a used car. The, the worst thing ever, a used car salesman. Yeah, clearly awful, terrible. Uh, and who would who would wear such an offensive mustache? Yeah, uh, but I mean, they go so far like to paint him as an utter scumbag. He says to Arnold's character, Ar- Arnold's character takes him on a test drive of a of a red Corvette because it's more like midlife crisis jokes, right? Very funny. Mm. Bill Paxton gets on the train like, oh, I'm trying to put the moves on this broad, and she's got these you know great tits, she's got an ass like a ten year old boy, and I was like, what the fuck? And then Ar- Arnold's character reaches over. And punches his lights out and breaks his nose, and then only only to reveal that that was a fantasy. Mm-hmm. So yes, what I mean, I'll never forgive James Cameron for making Bill Paxton say that line. It's um, <laughs> off. How was it good then? It's ugh. Yes. But so, I mean, when 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 this stretch of the movie is going on, it's probably like it's interesting because we haven't talked much about the big action stuff because the action stuff, like you're saying, it's it's for the most part staged well conceptually. I think it's all really fun. It's fun in in conception. Uh, some of the things in execution are a little odd. Like James Cameron relies a lot on stunt doubles with Arnold prosthetics or masks on. And he doesn't show them in close up, but he does show them in medium shots. Mm-hmm. And even though the focus on them might be a little soft or they might be backlit, you can still tell like you're like, that's some other fucking dude wearing a really ill-fitting Arnold face riding that horse or running away from that explosion. Like uh, it's a bad look. Uh, maybe this is one of the reasons this hasn't seen like a, a big restoration for HD. It's just like those shots don't hold up, honey. Well, uh, there's something we have to acknowledge also, which I think has contributed to this movie, not w- wanting to be part of the conversation. And it's a valid reason. Eliza Dushka is in the movie. Um, she plays Arnold and Jamie Lee's daughter. Uh, she was 12 years old at the time of the filming, and she she alleges that the stunt coordinator of the movie molested her. And I I, I believe her entirely. Um, I think she she brought this to light. I think about two to four years ago. Yeah, um, this is right as Me Too was breaking, and you know the story is unfortunately even worse than that. Like evidently, it is she voiced her experience um, to an adult being assaulted by this asshole. And they, you know, whoever it was confronted this guy, the the stunt coordinator. And it's believed that he may have done some sort of retaliation by improperly rigging a stunt for Eliza Dushku that she performs in the, in the third act of the film. And it's like, this is utterly despicable. Um, And it is now part of the movie's legacy forever. Well, and it, it's because in, in the piece that I wrote, I had to bring up, it immediately made me think of the Victor Salva film, Clown House. Ugh. It's important to know these things when they come to light, because I, I know there's a lot of people who would rather not have that information and be able to enjoy these movies as purely as they did the first time they saw them. But this is important stuff if it's out there to know. I, I mean, we can talk all day about how that relates to artists and and things in their in their general personal life but when it is things that were when it is abuse that was happening during the production of a movie and we are watching that movie we talk a lot on this show about how movies are made and if a movie is being made in a way that enables abusers to abuse people whether it be sexually or not then there's a fucking problem with the way movies are being made Mm mm-hmm so I mean it, it's it's just something that that's always going to be there. And and if you and if you're listening to this and you didn't know that, like I hate that I had to be the one to tell you about that, but I do think it's important to know these things. Yeah. That said, I will say this again, I think the action is fun in a purely kind of theme park way. I think I think I said to you it's it's very <laughs> It's not surprising to me that the next thing Cameron directed after this was the literal theme park ride T2 3D because so much of the staging of the big action scenes, it's fun, but it's like you're watching the greatest produced stunt show of all time. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of vehicular stuff that that is very, very theme parky. Mm-hmm. So as the movie continues to sideline all the terrorist stuff, um, we have this plot now where 
Arnold realizes that in order to potentially save his marriage, he'll have to deceive his wife into performing some sort of spy plot that she thinks is going on and uh, perform a strip tease for somebody that she doesn't know is actually him. And, you know, this this strip tease sequence has been talked about as like the centerpiece of this movie for many, many years. And like every other sort of big sequence in this movie, it's it's a little too fucking long, I think. You know, and for the time, James Cameron was sort of puffing himself up and saying like, oh, you know, women thought this scene was empowering. Whatever, dude. Uh, Sure, they did. (laughs) I'll be the first one to admit that Jamie Lee Curtis looks great with hair slick back and in that wonderful black dress. Um, But like this scene is it's like this movie is dicking around like what's going on. And it, it got to the point where it was like, what happened to the movie I was watching? Like I'm this movie has abandoned its prior self to tell this other story. And then that's when the the two movies that Cameron was sort of making smush back together again. Because at the end of this striptease sequence, the terrorists, you know, jump into the room and suddenly everything is sort of back on that track. And it's unfortunate because there is good chemistry going on between Arnold and Jamie Lee. Like the when the movie allows it to just be them, I think it really works. In this later back sequence, they get tied up and Arnold gets shot up with truth serum. And this is, of course, after uh, Jamie Lee has discovered that he is, in fact, the secret spy. And that moment when she gets that information and it's validated, she she plays it completely silently. Like, it's just the look on her face and cutting to reactions to Arnold. And it's like, you know what? Uh, This is working. Like, this is good work from these actors. Yeah. And then this truth serum bit when it's just them and she's getting to ask him questions about his, you know, he's saying, like, ask me something I'd normally lie about. There's fun jokes in there. Like she asked him, like, have you ever killed anyone? He's like, yeah, but they were all bad. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, hey, this movie isn't without heart and and between these characters. But unfortunately, uh, I I think so much of that gets swallowed up by the very massive and very impressive action in the back half. Sure. And. I mean, there's some sort of um, commando stuff going on where it's just sort of Arnold, you know, uh, Ramboing a whole lot of people. And Jamie Lee Curtis has to make a direct Rambo joke. And she goes, I married Rambo. Yeah. Lady. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, there is a, a bunch of good explosion and stunt, you know, good at special effects work. Uh, the terrorist guy shoots a rocket at like a big oil tanker and it, it explodes in rather extravagant fashion. I mean, my favorite one is Arnold using the big uh fuel hose and turning it into a flamethrower oh yeah well and what makes that gag better is jamie lee curtis seeing it right and saying like oh my god my my husband is just my husband is arnold swart is an arnold schwarzenegger character right (laughs) um you know like that's the joke and then we have this enormously extravagant uh sequence on the overseas highway in the florida keys where harrier jets are flying down and blowing up the bridge and there's a nuke and all sorts of stuff yeah yeah, and and that feels like it should be the climax of the movie, but then the movie has another climax. Right, they bring back the daughter character just for her to be damseled by the terrorist guy, mm-hmm. and Arnie takes one of the Harrier jets, flies it to downtown Miami, um, and he spends the climactic sequence using the Harrier jet's um, vertical takeoff system to basically sort of hover around and helicopter around in downtown Miami, and... Um, kill all the terrorists by shooting them through the windows and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, this is also all very Metal Gear Solid stuff. Sure. Um, it's very video gamey. Yeah. And, and and again, from a production standpoint, from a, from a tactile action movie standpoint, this all is really good. Yeah. I mean, it's an incredible effects sequence for sure. Um, when it comes to, you know, the jet, you know, and, and the blending of digital effects and, practical effects like this big jet that they had to build and the compositing like everything comes together very well in terms of the craft Mm -hmm. um and you know to 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 have the terrorists sort of jump onto the plane and you know get snagged on one of the missiles and then you know arnie fires the missile off you're fired yeah (laughs) classic arnold type you know one-liner mcclunky Um, yeah, I mean, it, I, I think when we get to the versus point, we'll, we'll make some points about action because if I, if I was going to go to bat for true lies, I would go to bat for it as an action extravaganza blockbuster. Yeah. Which it certainly is. Yes. I think there are problems in that particularly, like we were talking about with the, 
the shot choices Cameron makes and the editing. Um, yeah, the, and the, just Cameron not having the right sense of tone mm-hmm. for the comedy he thinks he's making. Sure. You know, it's like that sequence where Jamie Lee Curtis is firing some sort of automatic, you know, firearm like an Uzi or a Mac-10, something like that. She drops it and it falls down the stairs and it kills a whole bunch of people. That would be way funnier if it were like this thing that was like brrr and bang and over and everybody's like, holy fuck, holy shit, oh my God. Instead, that it lasts like 45 seconds as this gun tumbles down an endless staircase in slow motion and everybody's like, ah! I, I, it's like the joke was over 20 seconds ago, Jim. Well, I'd be interested because ha- having not seen the original, watching the trailer for it, that moment's in the trailer for La Total. And so it's like, I wonder how it play if it plays out like that, if it's quicker, if it's not quite the, you know, slow motion giant effects showcase. I mean, that this is definitely a movie because I think it's so important to reiterate that it comes after T2, that this was clearly a blank check, you know, just absolute carte blanche production for Cameron. Like he could do whatever he wanted with it. And I think it is an exercise in excess. Certainly, yes. And in doing so, I think the the hubris on display, <laughs> uh, which might be something we talk about when we get to the verses. But yeah, I, I, I do think we should shift gears here uh, before we come to our final thoughts about True Lies, because we got to talk about Hard Target. This was uh, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme, directed by John Woo, uh, produced by Sam Raimi and his producing partner, Rob Taper. Um, this from 1993. This is a movie I saw once, and and maybe people have seen a moment from it out there that has been a gif, and, and we'll get to that moment, but I'd seen this movie once. Travis, this was your very first time seeing the movie, um, and it's interesting that the, the basic premise overall is that it is another humans hunting humans type uh, plot like we had in Surviving the Game, but this one has a lot of very specific flavor to it. Because it's set in New Orleans. It does. So um, the opening sequence we get is something that um, was immediately familiar to us because you and I did the Ice T movie uh, Surviving the Game. Uh, we get this sequence of somebody being hunted by men with not just guns, but um, some really sort of signature weapons. Uh, this sort of bearded, down on his luck looking guy, shall we say, is being chased by a bunch of men, one of whom has a like air powered crossbow type weapon. And the sort of Raimi influences you see in the movie is like immediate, you know, where you see somebody shooting this weapon and you get those like, you know, uh, whip pans that, you know, have the arrow affixed to it. You see stuff even like in uh, Crime Wave, the Evil Dead movies all show these kinds of shots and you're like, oh, all right, so this has some really distinct, you know, Raimi esque style to it. Hell, d- d- don't you're pulling the 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 weird ones for people. Crime wave. It's the Doctor Octopus tentacle during the hospital scene in Spider Man Two. Well, yeah, people will recognize that because it's popular. But fucking Crime Wave and Evil Dead happened before that. <laughs> it is, it, but it's that what what you're referring to is like it's basically an object that we have a close up on that is being propelled in the frame, but it is locked pretty much to the center of the frame while the background is whipping behind it. Yeah. Um, it's a wonderful comic book kind of panel shot of action. Sure. A- and and this open, we, we have this, you know, guy running, cut to this, guy running, cut to this, and then guy running, cut to the title of the movie being shot in through animated arrows to spell hard target. I mean, we're in for it already, right out the gate. You know, y- it... it- you and I watched two different cuts of this movie. I'm starting to wonder if you and I didn't have different titles because I don't remember animated arrows in the opening titles. Maybe that's no, just well, me. It was it was very yeah, it was it was very kind of not that distinct, but you could tell that when the title came in it was like shh, 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 like it was it, it was trying to mimic the look of the arrow. Yeah. It was a nineties intertitle. There's a lot of whooshing. There's a lot of clanging and it's animated. Exactly. That moment when that title hits on screen, you get this big signature clang. Well, and we should say the sound design and particularly the score by a uh, Graham uh, Ravel. I've said, I misspelled, I, I misspoke I, his name before. I call him Graham Ravel. So, okay. So Graham Ravel set, you know, sets this mood perfectly. And the fact that it is set in new Orleans, we have this very, particular sound this bayou sound eventually the the story really takes uh 
takes form with the lead actress, um, whose name, of course, I don't have pulled up because I'm not as good of a person at the doing the show as Travis is. <laughs> so, so uh, what is her name? Yancey um, Butler. <laughs> yeah, that's her name. Yancey Butler. Yancey Butler, who is looking for her father, who we eventually come to find out was the man being hunted at the beginning. And she's coming to New Orleans. She doesn't know the area. And she eventually runs into... <laughs> she runs into Jean-Claude Van Damme's character, who is Chance Boudreau. Yep. And we meet Chance while he's eating at a diner. They call it a utility restaurant on the sign. I'm like, it's like the full moon utility restaurant or something like that. What's a utility restaurant, y'all? I've been to New Orleans and never eaten at a utility restaurant. But he's he's sitting at the bar at the diner and eating some bowl of gumbo or something like that and pays with the meager change that's in his pocket. And we get this wonderful close-up on the earring in his left ear. And you're like, okay, this this greasy mullet and this earring and this like weird uh, overcoat that this guy's wearing in the New Orleans heat. It's like, okay, this is sort of a an immediate, like strong take on who this character is. I, I, I found really fun off the bat. But um, the the sort of Southern fried flavor that the movie gives you immediately, just in the stylistic aspects, whether it's Graham Ravel's score or the use of, you know, all the like, location shooting in New Orleans, there's something really distinct and signature about this where you feel like, oh, okay, this is, you know, the movie is taking root here. This isn't going to be some sort of globe trotting thing. Like the movie is setting down firm stylistic roots, and this is where our story is going to take place. I like that feeling. Yeah, I mean the 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 music, the look of the movie, the lighting of the movie in Hard Target. It it, it all is tied into this particular area and turning the location into a, a real space and a theme. And, and so that that's all established extremely well. Uh, this was John Woo's first American uh, directed film. And I, I am so shocked that it does not get discussed because John Woo is always brought up as, you know, one of the great action filmmakers. And everybody talks about, you know, his his films, which, you know, some of which we've done on the show here, like The Killer and Hard Boiled and Better Tomorrow. And when they talk about his American output. The majority of discussion, I think, centers around Mission Impossible 2 and Face Off. Like, a lot of people love Face Off, and I like Face Off well enough. Face Off's good. I like it. Yeah. Nobody talks about Hard Target, and the fact that it's his first American film, I would think, would garner more discussion. And then after having rewatched it and Travis seeing it, we are shocked nobody talks about this movie. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's... It's definitely a simple movie, and it definitely pulls a lot of things back. And it's a smaller scale action film than what you might expect of you know Van Damme's prior output, say like Universal Soldier, which we've talked about in the show. Drew and I both like Universal Soldier, but you know this thing where Van Damme is playing this sort of vagrant guy in a greasy overcoat, beating up dudes in the alleyways of New Orleans. You're like, okay, maybe this is a little bit dinky, but stylistically. With Wu directing and Raimi around to sort of offer his guidance, like this is really stylistically distinct in so many ways, and and that offers a lot of pleasure right from the start. Uh, and you can definitely tell like how this may have been sort of out of character for what American audiences wanted as far as action cinema in the sort of early to mid nineties. Well, and especially, I mean, this comes out in ninety three a year before they had Terminator 2. And it's it's not that kind of a movie. Uh, I, I think Hard Target really ties into that kind of Raimi idea. Like, if you think of his movies like Dark Man, I think Hard Target is closer to that in terms of tone, style, and execution. Because you say it's a distinct movie. It absolutely is. But if it was just distinct, that wouldn't be enough. It's also that... It is executed incredibly well from a, 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 a stylistic standpoint in terms of the direction and the kineticism of the action. Sure. Speaking of Darkman, uh, both Hard Target and Darkman share a screenwriter in Chuck Farrer. Chuck Farrer also plays the uh, homeless veteran that's being hunted at the beginning of the movie. So his fingerprints are on the film, on, on both films um, in, in a lot of ways. So. I feel like Farr was the right guy to ta tackle a story like this. Farr himself was a veteran. Um, and the film is not without 
commentary about how America treats its veterans. It has sort of a mm-hmm. a Rambo type commentary about when veterans come home from foreign wars, like what's left for them. Universal Soldier also had similar commentary, but this handles it in sort of a uh, a more sort of down and dirty way. It's a lot more personal. Um, and it's not about people being robbed of their humanity like it was in Universal Soldier. This is a movie about um, not recognizing the value of the humanity in people who are down and out. Um, it's about demonizing the lower classes. Well, something that we kept talking about when we because we watched Hard Target, we synced up our, our, our watches together. Something that came up so much was the sentimentality of the movie. Yeah. That it was a movie that was not afraid to embrace a a lot of sentimentality and that's something that's that's reflected in Jean-Claude Van Damme I think as 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 an actor and in this movie in, in particular uh there's a moment where he has one of his friends who is uh one of the homeless veterans who ends up also being hunted and killed when he comes across his body Van Damme he has he sheds a tear and that's not something you really got from the kind of machismo action heroes. Like you didn't have action heroes who were willing to cry. Right. You would see action heroes get angry and exact revenge. But for Van Damme's character to actually look up and get a close up where he's crying is really, really different. You know, and and this is one of the reasons, you know, that that difference is one of the reasons I think Hard Target maybe isn't talked about as much or maybe wasn't as successful as it could have been. It wasn't a box office bomb by any means, but I think a lot of people involved with it expressed some disappointment in how it turned out. It didn't light audiences on fire, didn't light critics on fire, and it was different from what your typical action movie of the of the time was offering. Um, you have a martial arts action star with Jean-Claude Van Damme, but this isn't a martial arts movie. But it is being directed by somebody from the Hong Kong system, even though John Woo is not really noted as a martial arts film, you know, director. He's a shoot 'em up uh, Hong Kong guy, and this is definitely a shoot 'em up movie, but has those sort of acrobatic stunts that you might expect from Van Damme. So it may have been a bit of an odd mix. Like people just may have not quite gotten what it was going for. But the the stuff like that, they're, my favorite action sequence in the movie comes in a. Uh, it's it's a road sort of bridge sequence where Van Damme rides a motorcycle at the uh, the bad guy sort of playing chicken with it, and then he stands up on the motorcycle and sort of rides it like a surfboard, crashes the motorcycle into the front of a car, and then proceeds to front flip over the roof of the car and land on the other side. But he doesn't land it perfectly. He actually rolls and stumbles and gets hurt. It's like I love the vulnerability of this and the and the the execution of these amazing acrobatic gags it's awesome i mean this is definitely in that if you've seen one of john woo's you know kind of classic uh you know films that he made you know like like hard boiled the killer better tomorrow you're gonna see that same kind of style and and kind of markers in hard target and all of that stuff is great because he knows how to shoot action like you know in that for example that that dive over the car he gets a shot of van damme from kind of the rear of the car you know head on so we can see his face even though that is clearly a different setup but it it sells us on like okay this is this is van damme's character doing this so when they cut to the shot of the stunt person doing it you don't see the stunt person you know their face hardly at all you buy it as van damme uh, there's another moment that we're going to talk about in terms of making sure you get your actors in the action shot, which is just incredible, because here's the thing. Hard Target is a laundry list of incredible moments. It is. And not just action moments either. There are some really, really funny comedy beats, too. Uh, early on in the movie, we meet a detective played by Cassie Lemons, who actually wrote and directed Eve's Bayou, which is a really interesting movie you spoke about a couple episodes back. Mm-hmm. And she is this detective who, you know, the the, the daughter of uh, Binder, the Chuck Farrer character, comes and says, hey, I think my dad's missing. She's like, well, you know, he's he's a drifter. He's a hobo. He's, he's not missing. He's just homeless. And <laughs> the weird thing about this scene is that as uh, Yancey Butler and Jean-Claude Van Damme's character come in to, to meet her, Cassie Lemons' character has this tiny birthday cake on her desk and she lights the candle and just 
<laughs> Just as Yancey Butler's going to come over and talk to her, she takes her whole birthday cake and shuts it in a drawer on her desk with the candle still burning. And you're like, well, what? You know? <laughs> and then she, uh, as the scene ends, takes the fucker out again and blows the candle out. And you get your beautiful, like, uh, Lawrence of Arabia scene transition as it dissolves to the New Orleans skyline in the next day. Well, the the edit on this movie is superb. I, I these transitions, there's so many good transitions in this movie that feel like they had to be written. Sure, and they're dramatically interesting, but they're also played frequently for comedy, like the candle being blown out mm. and dissolving to the New Orleans skyline, and then you get this bitch and wailing Southern Fried guitar solo <laughs> on the soundtrack. You're like, I I just love everything this movie has to offer from that whole standpoint of like pure southern fried cheese the flavor yeah it's it's and it's it's a very flavorful film i love that about it and you would think a guy like john woo maybe not wouldn't really be invested in sort of portraying this particular aspect of you know american culture in the new orleans area you know the sort of the bayou and and cajun culture but the movie is kind of obsessed with making itself a really, really Cajun film. <laughs> and, and it was really just a, an excuse to explain away Jean-Claude Van Damme's French accent. Um, but he doesn't sound like anybody from the Bayou. No. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I do want to talk a little bit about Jean-Claude because, like, we talked about Arnie as the star. I, I think Jean-Claude Van Damme has become my personal favorite action star of this era because he's so very different than a lot of his contemporaries. And I do think that there is a bias or was a bias against him in a, in a way that like we talked about Arnold being in on the joke that is Arnold. Sure. I think, I think that's part of the reason why he became very aware of the kinds of roles he could do and the kind of roles that people wanted to see him in. But Jean-Claude Van Damme, he, he was a joke because he has a particular accent and people, especially specifically American audiences are going to f find fun in that no matter what. But Jean-Claude Van Damme wasn't in on that as a joke in, in so many, you know, in the last 20 years or so, you can see he's leaned into that almost too hard. Sure. Where, you know, he does all these advertisements or he does, you know, spoof shows or something where he's you know poking fun at himself. I think he finally realized, like, I have to do that. You know, he he shows up in The Expendables 2 playing a character called Villain. Um, so <laughs> he's the main villain, if you didn't get that. Uh, so I, I think during his heyday, Jean-Claude was taking himself very seriously and people were going to make fun of him. And I think it's really a shame because in Hard Target and in a lot of his output from the 90s, Jean-Claude has, like you said, this this vulnerability to him where you described it kind of perfectly where like he has insecurities, but his insecurities are never about his masculinity or his, you know, badass ability. There are other things. Yeah, that's a it's a sensitivity and a um a willingness I think to be portrayed as or a willingness to be portrayed as something less than like uh an ubermensch. Yes. You know, he is he is vulnerable. He's not this huge hulking, you know, bodybuilder. Of course he's ripped as fuck, but he's not this giant, you know, fridge large meat, you know, bulk man muscle type character. Mm -hmm. Um he's he's flexible, he's limber. And he's got a Frenchy accent, which I think maybe a lot of American audiences didn't think was cool or manly. But I'm here to tell you, it, it all works in this movie's favor. And when you pair him up against the villains in this film, oh. um, most notably Lance Henriksen and Arnold Vosloo, who, of course, the second one you'll recognize is the guy who played Imhotep in the Stephen Summers Mummy movies. They're villaining their asses off in this movie, and Van Damme is rising to sort of meet them. Um, with whatever it is he does best. Um, so I think it's pretty apparent that you and I are really in this movie's corner by this point. I mean, at this point, it's just a matter of rattling off every incredible thing. You mentioned Lance Henriksen. Why aren't we talking about this as one of Lance Henriksen's greatest arch roles of all time? Oh, my God. He is chewing the scenery. There is a wonderful scene where he gets to play the piano and look really, really villainous. And it's intercut with a scene of this uh, sort of lower schmuck that that works for him trying to recruit people to be hunted. 
and uh, you know the the evil piano playing while Lance Henriksen is staring off into the middle distance. Uh, it's just like, oh man, this is this is so wonderfully arch. Uh, he gets these incredible costumes to wear in the movie, um, and he starts off being pretty reserved, but as the movie goes on, his character Fushan um, gets wackier and wackier. And uh, by the end of the movie, the, the giant climactic sequence, Henriksen is just pitch perfect. Love it. It is the best kind of classic comic book villain acting. Uh, it, it's so good. Um, uh, Saint, uh, Arnold Vosloo is the perfect main henchman type character. He gets a number of wonderful lines. Uh, well, he, he's very, very good at glowering. You know, there's so many close-ups where he just glowers straight at the camera, and it's it's awesome. And you think, like, oh, it's the guy from Imhotep and the Mummy. Like, he's a really uh, impressive visual presence. But he actually gets a lot of dialogue in this movie. And, a, you know, and of course, his, his very thick South African accent. And you're like, damn it, why didn't they give this guy more dialogue in the fucking Mummy movies? He's really good. <laughs> he's really good. When, you know, he's just like, I come back here. I'm cutting up a steak. Like, mm-hmm. it's just like, oh, it's so great. Um so that that's all wonderful. Uh, pretty much, you know, just there's tons of action beats. We could just list off all the action beats because that I I don't think there's a weak action beat in the entire movie. You are correct. They're all good. It's all good. It's all staged well. It's all edited well. It's all framed well. When it's funny, it's it's really working as comedy. But yeah, it's, it's definitely not an action comedy in the way that True Lies was trying to be an action comedy. This is more of a straight action film, but it's having a fuckload of fun doing it. Um, you even get action beats from Wilford Brimley. They let Wilford Brimley be an action hero. W- Wilford Brimley shows up in, in the back like quarter of the movie as as Travis called him Bayou Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> and he is he is he is Chance's uncle. And so Wilford Brebley, like he he's introduced making moonshine and saying stuff like that make a jackrabbit smack the bear. Like <laughs> it's incredible. And then then the movie turns Wilford Brimley into an action hero. Yeah, yeah. There's a uh, a sequence where um all the baddies, you know, Arnold Vosloo and, and uh Henriksen and you know their their hunters who are all hunting, you know, homeless veterans. They all stumble upon this guy's camp in the bayou, and uh, Brimley blows it up. You know, he blows up his still with all the moonshine to try and, you know, kill them all. And there's this shot of Brimley riding away on a horse with his bow held high in one arm, and just like you, this huge fucking explosion in the background. And you can tell, like, they did that shot for real. You know, Wil- Wilfred Brimley's really just galloping away Yee-haw! with that fucking bow. It's so awesome. It is. One of the best images in cinema I will ever see. <laughs> like, and I'd say that with no hyper, like watching, and, because that's what's important here. When we're talking about the Arnold, you know, the stunt doubles and Arnold masks doing this stuff on horseback. This is really Wilford Brimley in the frame in slow motion, galloping away from a real shack exploding. Yeah. <sighs> It's incredible. Um, yeah. And all the sort of like wacky Cajun dialogue they give him is is never not hilarious because everything out of his mouth is like this is like stupid Cajun cliche. But, um, but but the movie knows that it can it's OK to be cartoony because it like the only the way I learned about this movie was from a gif where Jean-Claude grabs a rattlesnake and punches it in the face and knocks it out. Now, that moment removed from the movie is is just ridiculous and funny and and cheesy to see but in the context of the movie it is so wonderful oh yeah because because the setup is that it's him and um yancey butler's character yancey butler and you think it's going to be the kiss scene because he's like do you trust me and she's like, yeah, and he's like, close your eyes. And so she closes her eyes and you think she, he's going to lean in for the kiss. But really, he sees that behind her is the snake. So he grabs the snake and he's pulling it down. And in slow motion, she l- sees the snake and her eyes go wide. And at that moment, there's a guitar riff just. There! <laughs> and it's so perfect. Yeah. He slaps the snake and punches the snake. And of course, you know, it. it it faints like snakes do. Um, and then he rips the rattle off with his teeth. Like, how can you not have a great time with this? 
Um, this is ripe for rediscovery. And we haven't even talked about the climactic sequence, which takes place in a warehouse full of decrepit Mardi Gras floats. Yes, as, as the oh. score, as the score cue calls it, Mardi Gras graveyard, which is it's it's that's what you're talking about when you talk about the flavor and the distinctness. It's like, you, yeah, you could have this fight in just any other old warehouse. Like right. it could just be like like tons of cheap action movies you know cheap direct-to-video movies from the same era do where it's like yeah we rented out this warehouse and we'll just have some guys follow our railings but this one they use their budget and they're like let's stock this place with mardi gras floats with creepy clown faces and horses and stuff it's so cool and you get tons of great action you get a wonderful villain death from lance henriksen oh man the way they time that stuff too like the last moment before he goes kaboom insanity like so fucking good so good like legitimate like going for comedy nailing it nailing the cathartic like yes the villain has been destroyed with a big laugh moment so if it isn't clear at this point true lies can get fucked yeah hard target wipes the floor with true lies <laughs> like i i hate to be that harsh you know especially if you have listen if we have listeners out there that enjoy true lies but hard target needs to be seen needs to be talked about needs to, i i i have a particular love of jean-claude van damme and his filmography and i really think hard target is way up there with the best i've ever seen of his yeah i mean this is a movie that i think is Arch and Silly been in ways that work perfectly well for the material. Like, it's aged so well. It's a really non-standard and, uh, I think, more sensitive portrayal of masculinity in action films, uh, which evidently didn't sit all that well with Van Damme. The, like, Van Damme... It, it, I'm not sure how true this is, but there's a sort of an apocryphal story that in post-production, Van Damme hired his own editor to make a Van Damme-approved cut of the movie with that, like, excised other characters just so that Van Damme could have more screen time and more close-ups. <laughs> <laughs> I, again, I can't vouch for the truth of that, but I think the movie allowing itself to be a bit more of a sensitive portrayal for this guy who is, you know, is, you know, we have the stereotype action character of like the man of few words, but there's, there's supposed to be sort of a strength in that silence. But I think there's a lot of vulnerability in this character's silence. And I like his sensitivity and his love for, you know, his, his, uh, his, his friends basically like that's, that's just so warm. Um, you know, he, he actually gets some like chance to show affection to the people he loves, his family. There is a, a romantic subplot that was excised from the movie. Uh, Yancey Butler, evidently, they they have a, a scene where their romance is sort of firmed up a little bit more on the plot, but that that was gone, and I think much to the movie's benefit. Yes, I, I agree with that. Um, but I, I love that there's a sequence where Van Damme is doing some detectiving, and he gets beat up by two guys. You would never see, see Steven Seagal or even Ar like when Arnold got beat up, it'd be like, yeah, there, you know, his shirt gets torn a little bit, and maybe there's a little tiny cut above his brow that looks like perfectly symmetrical, and and you know, but Van Damme will allow himself to get his ass kicked. Or like you saw, you know, there was a news story that came out right around the time um, that latest Fast and the Furious movie came out, the one with Idris Elba and Rock and Statham. Oh, Hobbs and Shaw. And there mm. was a there was a talk of like you had to show like an equal number of close ups get of the two leads getting hit. Like one couldn't get hit more than the other. Mm -hmm. um, there 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 couldn't be a scene where one of them got their ass totally handed to them. Like, and it's so fucking vain. Yes. But I love that this movie and the, the way that it actually really came together, you know, much d despite Van Damme's sort of like vain <laughs> attempt to create a cut where he was the real hero. Um, it's like, no, this, this movie is, a little bit more nuanced, uh, you know, offers a bit more commentary and portrays him as more of a human being, a little bit more sensitive, even though he can do all these incredible kicks and flips. Oh, my God. It's it's funny for you to call a movie like Hard Target nuanced when it also features Wilford Brimley shooting people through the throat with a bow and arrow. Um, but you get that you get both. It, it's it's two great tastes that taste great together. Yeah. The only thing that hasn't um, aged well or the, the only thing I really didn't like about it is Cassie Lemons. His character is good enough that she should have received a better treatment in the film. Instead, yes, she is shot about halfway through the movie and they just have to leave her body. And I'm like, but God damn it. That character is really good. I liked her, you know, and I understand the conflict of like killing off a character that we like. Um, I understand that that is good conflict, but like, God damn it, 
I, I really wanted to have her have more screen time in the movie because she's she's really good. Yeah, I I, I agree. I, I wish she would have stuck around, especially because she sticks around. She does a lot of the the detectiving, and and there's a great sequence with her interrogating a doctor. Um, God, I mean, just talking about this movie, I want to watch it again. <laughs> it, it's it's that good. It's that good of a time. I mean. I'll be interested to hear the comments on this because I'm sure a lot more people have seen True Lies than they have Hard Target. But it, we urge you to watch Hard Target. Like it is absolutely one of the joys, the uh, one of the most joyous screenings I've had all year. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely one of the best films I've seen this year, uh, hands down. And and I said to you, you know, as we were chatting about this, I'm like, this is a five star movie easily. I loved it. We were syncing up the the movie and and talking about it together, and <laughs> the. You know, we're saying like, oh, it's really good. It's really great. But then <laughs> then Travis just goes, dude, this movie's fucking great <laughs> with great in all capital letters. And I I, I just it warmed my heart so much. Like, and so. it was right when Jean-Claude Van Damme ripped the rattle off the snake with his teeth. And he doesn't do that just for the hell of it. He does that actually to set it up as a trap for the people <laughs> following him so that somebody else gets bitten on the face. <laughs> the snake. I mean... How can you not love this movie? I just can't. I don't want to live in a world where Hard Target is not as beloved as it should be. So hopefully we can do our our little bit to to get it out there. But we do have to go over to the shelf where we pick some movies that might act as a good pairing or substitute for our main topic. And as always, we encourage you loyal listeners to go to genrevision.com, comment on the post for this episode with your own shelf picks, and we'll feature them in next week's episode. Travis, what are you pulling off the shelf for True Lies versus Hard Target? If you're looking for an action comedy uh, with some darker edges to it and some plotting issues and some tonal issues, uh, I would recommend that you watch Police Story 2 instead of watching True Lies. Mm. Police Story 2 kind of loses its way halfway through when it gets involved in a darker detective story. And there's like this big tonal shift. Uh, When you and I watched Police Story 2, you and I watched the longer cut. And I think that's something that uh, I wouldn't do again. I'd watch the shorter cut. Luckily, which it, both of the cuts are available on the recent Criterion release. Mm-hmm. But some of the stuff in Police Story 2 tops a lot of the stuff in Police Story 1 in terms of comedy and in terms of action. The, the fight scene that takes place on the playground in Police Story 2 oh. is just a masterpiece. It's it so is. fucking good. And then the scene where Jackie Chan's character, uh, Kakui, his girlfriend, May, comes to uh, chew him out at the police station and she follows him into the men's locker room and she's, <laughs> she's chasing after him <laughs> and goes into uh, the toilet area and one of the other characters is in there taking a shit and she just she just busts down the door and trying to chase Jackie Chan's character not even not even seeing the other guy taking a shit it's such a perfectly executed moment of comedy and it proves to me it's like oh damn now this is how you handle action comedy mm. uh, Jim Cameron I think still has a few things to learn about action comedy from movies like police story too. So that's my shelf pick. What are you pulling off the shelf? Well, uh, because I love Jean-Claude Van Damme, I I wanted to give him a little bit more love and it tying in with true lies since it's about Arnold being a super secret spy. I said, why not recommend a spy movie with Jean-Claude Van Damme? That's not great, but it's kind of wonderful. And this is double team. Uh, this is directed by Sui Hark, who was a producer for a number of John Woo movies and a director in his own right. Um, I believe this might have been his first American film. He he did two films uh, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme. This is infamously the movie that paired Jean-Claude with Dennis Rodman. Um, <laughs> uh, the villain is played by Mickey Rourke. It's a big, extravagant like it's it's a stupid movie i will admit to that but it's kind of gloriously stupid um and again it's it's doing by having that particular perspective of sui harks it's doing things that not a lot of american action films were doing now grant you know this was when american action films and a lot of the directors of the time and producers clearly were looking at the action explosion going on in hong kong And saying, like, we need some of that because those movies are making crazy bank. We're making good money importing those movies here and dubbing them and everything. You know, Jackie Chan's becoming a commodity up to American audiences at this point. Um, Double Team is ridiculous. It's cartoony. But it's kind of wonderful. I I 
have very fond memories of, of watching it. Um, so it's one to check out. And, and I'm hoping, I mean, when, when you and I, Travis, were watching Hard Target and we talked, uh, we talked about uh, Jean-Claude, I kept saying, it's like, I'm, I'm going to try and get you, get you acclimated, get you turned on to Jean-Claude Van Damme stuff. And you said, like, after Universal Soldier and Hard Target, you might be becoming a fan. Tis possible. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly open to that. But uh, we do have to do our listener shelf picks from our previous full genre vision episode, which was on Beyond the Door. Uh, Mr. Milksteak went with Treasure of the Four Crowns, a movie I've always known about is it's kind of an Indiana Jones ripoff, but has always been kind of infamous. Uh, and I believe it was a, a shot for 3D movie. Um, always been intrigued by it, but I've never seen it. So thank you, Mr. Milksteak. Eric Fuchs recommended <laughs> recommended Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 1. Um <laughs> If you want a movie about a horrendous supernatural childbirth, <laughs> it doesn't get more horrifying than this. Um, I, I, I can, I can agree. Uh, <laughs> and loyal listener JT went with a nightmare on Elm street to Freddy's resent a nightmare on Elm street to Freddy's revenge. It's a possession film has some overt subtext and it's pretty wackadoo. I, I like nightmare on Elm street Two quite a bit. I've never actually seen the whole thing. One of these days. Yeah, it's worth it. Um, so thank you, as always, uh, for the shelf picks. And, and you know, we're, we're sorry to have missed a week, but we'll talk about that a little bit later at the end of the episode. Right now, let's do some currently consuming. Nom, 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 nom. Travis, what's been on your plate? Uh, let's see. Uh, I watched The Hunt for Red October for the first time. Oh, great movie. Yeah, this was recently um, remastered in 4K and HDR. And uh, Patrick H. Willems did a video essay on how McTiernan managed the, uh, the the Russian language stuff in the movie. And it was a great video essay. And, of course, McTiernan, brilliant director, handled it very, very well. Um, I, I'm not normally one for, like, Tom Clancy stories or, like, the Jack Ryan character. But, damn, this is a good movie. Yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of submarine movies in general. Um, and this is obviously one of the most lauded. Uh, it, it's good because I'm the same way. I'm not a big fan of like Tom Clancy, secret spy, covert ops type stuff. But this is basically like a Star Trek movie without the Federation uniforms. Exactly. It's that's why I think I like the submarine aspect of it. It's like, well, it's about, you know, two warring nations and tension. Like it's a tense movie. And, uh, you know, that sounds very broad, but I mean that in the sense of like, it's about communication between two different peoples, which for Star Trek, it would be used metaphorically through an alien race or something. Right. Whereas in this, it is no actual, you know, Russians and Americans and all of this. Uh, it's a wonderfully crafted movie. Uh, I, 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 I feel like every time I'll watch it, I'll love it a little bit more. And it's gorgeous too. It's a really, really good looking movie. Oh yeah. So uh, highly recommend it if you've never seen it before. Even if you're not into spy thrillers and that kind of stuff, it is, uh, it has got the goods. Anyway, um, what's on your plate? Well, I wrote a review for this, so we'll link to that in the show notes at uh, for the post at genrevision.com. I reviewed Eurovision Song Contest: colon, The Story of Fire Saga. Boy, that title sucks. It's awful. <laughs> Imagine having to write it in every paragraph to, you know, appease SEO reasons. Um, so this is a, a, a Gary Sanchez Productions uh, piece, which is Will Ferrell's studio. And um, this, I, I have to cop to saying I'm not into Eurovision. I know what it is. I get it. Like, I'm like, OK, I see what that is. But it's just not my particular bag. Um, I feel that if you like that stuff, this will scratch some certain fan. It's like, oh, look, I know this popular Eurovision winner makes an appearance. And the the gaudiness and the over-the-top production value of the numbers and things like that. Um, the parody songs are pretty fun. Uh, surprisingly, I did not know Dan Stevens was in it. So that was a treat. Always a treat. I love Dan. He and he's great in the movie. Um, Rachel McAdams. The, the the main plot is that Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams are these two Icelanders who have grown up as kids, and and it's Will Ferrell's dream ever since he was a kid to win the Eurovision Song Contest. And Rachel McAdams' character has been in 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 love with him pretty much since they were kids, 
but he doesn't notice it and he's just totally focused on winning and she's kind of going along so she can be with him and fulfill his dream in the hopes that it will bring them together. Rachel McAdams is the real secret heart of the movie and she's very good. She's very funny. Um, Like I said, Dan Stevens is great. He's the Russian uh, contestant and he is very obviously gay, but because he's right, like they like Rachel McAdams asks him like, so I have a question. Are you gay? And he's like, no, there are no gay men in Russia. <laughs> he's, he's like, and she's like, that's statistically possible. He's like, nope, hundred percent, nothing. She's like, gender fluid, nope, it's been proven, hundred percent, no gays. Um, <laughs> and, and that comes around in a really funny because when you watch his dance numbers, it's like, oh come on. <laughs> so that's fun. The problem is Will Ferrell, and I wish he had cast somebody else in the lead role. Because he's so distracting, he's a, he's a puzzle piece that doesn't fit into the rest of the movie. He looks out of place, and he's kind of doing his usual Will Ferrell shtick. Um, and it's a shame because I'm I'm not one of these people who dislikes Will Ferrell, but I think a lot of the times he, especially in this later part of his career, I think his I think his leading man status needs to be reappraised. Like I I just don't think there are a lot of roles that are right for him to be the lead in. And this is one of them. Yeah. I mean, Will Ferrell is sort of an odd holdover from a time where you, you hired a guy to play himself. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's as weird as it sounds, not as common as it used to be. You know, you hired Dan Stevens because he, he's got tremendous range. You hire Rachel McAdams because she has tremendous range. Ferrell you know, the biggest range that we've seen out of him is like going from Anchorman to like, uh, what, Stranger Than Fiction? Uh, about. Well, and, and it's interesting because the, this 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 movie fits into a very particular thing in Will Ferrell's career where he likes to do these very specific niche parodies mm-hmm. where he does like Casa Mi de Padre. Um, Casa de Mi Padre. De Mi Padre, <laughs> sorry. Um, Casa de Mi Padre. Two beers, Travis can get that one right. Yes. Um, or the spoils of Babylon. Or I even in my review mentioned uh, a deadly adoption, which was when him and Kristen Wiig did that Lifetime movie. Right. And they right, did right. it. They they did it totally straight. But obviously, the casting of them puts this pale of parody over the whole thing, yeah. where it's like we're acknowledging that we're in a Lifetime movie. Yeah, winking at it. Yeah. Yes, and and they should just I do think, a Hallmark movie and get it over with. Yeah. Um. So uh, with those niche things, I'm like, well, the first barrier you have to be is in on the very specific joke they're doing. Um, And two, you have to accept it as this is Will Ferrell getting to kind of play out this very specific niche parody that he has an interest in. And and I don't believe it's a, a cynical one. I think he loves these things that he parodies. Sure. Yeah. I think like his his telenovela, you know, Casa de mi Padre kind of stuff is like. That's so niche, but it's clearly something he was passionate about. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm totally happy for him. That's that's cool. I haven't seen that movie yet, but I would like to. And I mean, uh, the thing that I say is a, a Eurovision Song Contest, colon, the story of Fire Saga. Uh, it looks great. It's shot by Danny Cohen, who shot Les Miserables and King's Speech and, you know, these like big... <laughs> big to do movies and now yeah, he's doing those this. two big to do movies were shot like shit bro have you seen those movies <laughs> well tom hooper movies he don't know how to well shoot that's a that, movie. <laughs> that's the thing it's tom hooper that is clearly the problem not oh, danny cohen this is true the 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 lighting and the color grading and all of that is is good on those movies very good and that that adds a certain production sheen to this plus since they're you know partnering with eurovision they have all of this incredible access and huge you know production numbers and stuff so as a production, it's very, very good. Yeah. I but like that. You know, you, you're you like, you, you take a major event that's already happening and you decide to just shoot your movie there. And it's like, well, you know, we didn't have to build the sets for the movie. The sets were going to be built anyways for the Eurovision Song Contest. So. Right. Because like, it's a good way to save money in your production. Sure, sure. And, and get some, it's basically, you know, product placement. I'm sure Eurovision helped pay for a huge amount of the budget of that movie. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I, I feel like if if you're not into the Eurovision thing, if you're not into just Will Ferrell in general, it, it's it's kind of an avoid because, you know, and and it's like all of these kind of movies with this this kind. Of, it's like, oh yeah, hey, Pierce Brosnan's in a supporting role. It's always nice. To, it's like, it'll always be like you know that actor's playing the disappointed dad this time, 
you know, that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, because the story itself has no surprises. Like it is, it every beat is going to play out exactly as you expect it. Um, and for comedy, I think that is sometimes fatal because comedy very often relies on surprise. Um, and to have none of that in the story is is kind of disappointing. Um, so yeah, I, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> That's my review. Resounding yeah. commendation. Thank you, Drew. Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't even remember the name of the movie other than uh, Eurovision. So it's, There you go. Um, before we end things, we, we're we not actually doing comment of the week this week, but I did want to get a little personal and, and say I wanted to thank all the comments that I got asking me about my move and, and wishing me the best of luck and that I was safe. It, it's It's been a crazy couple of weeks, and... Um, you know, I, I want to thank everybody for sticking with the show. You know, I want to thank the comments that we got for the pitch party episode that we did on my Cyclops pitch. Um, that was kind of a an audible we had to pull because I just wasn't able to get a movie in and, and set up to record uh, the previous week. And you guys commented. You had great comments. I, that, I love that about the pitch party stuff, which we do. You know, we, we plan to do with, you know, uh, a, a lot more on on the Patreon. Um, so thank you guys for that. But we're I, I'm all good. We're settled in. We're back. Uh, we survived June and we will survive July because next month. We're kicking off another theme month, Travis. Oh, we're revisiting a prior theme month as well. Uh, next month, July 2020, is Alien Invasions 2.0. You will see such incredible films spoken about, like, uh, let's see, Extro, uh, which is our, our global gonzo pick. You'll see Abel Ferrara's Body Snatchers from the 90s. Uh, you'll hear about a Robert Heinlein uh, adaptation called The Puppet Masters. Uh, we're going to revisit the 1953 adaptation War of the Worlds, which is going to hit the Criterion Collection this month. And then we're going to top the month off with a versus that um, I can already tell you we're going to have a hard time with, and it's Attack the Block versus The World's End. I am kind of terrified of that episode. <laughs> it's going to be a hard choice, and I'm already like putting down a mandate. like We can't choose a tie like we no can't, ties we no. can't have a cop out on that shit like we got to choose one yeah it's gonna be a hard choice well so we'll see so we hope you'll be along the right you know next week we'll be starting with extra uh, for our, our global gonzo entry as well so uh, i think it's gonna be a really really fun month i'm excited to revisit alien invasion movies and take a look and see what they were all saying about the time and what they're trying to explore i think it's gonna be a really really great theme month and we hope you'll be along for the ride so as always, we want to thank you all so, so much for listening. I'm Drew Deach. I'm Travis Newton. And we'll see you next week. On the bayou. <laughs> on, on the bayou. I'm going to go watch Hard Target again. <laughs>